Good. Uh, get, get it kicked off. So um, welcome, everybody, to uh, It's Already, Can You Believe That, May 12th. And uh, I hope everyone is doing well, everyone's safe as we're opening up uh, businesses in Alachua and Gainesville. It's definitely, uh, mm -hmm. it's definitely good to see. And hopefully everybody's being very careful and practicing all the guidelines while you're out there. As I bump into uh, uh, all of our Rotarian friends at times in the store, it's kind of hard to tell right off the bat with the mask. But um, if it's me, the bald head kind of right, Chad? <clears throat> Perfect. All right. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and, and kick off our Tuesday, May 12th meeting, and I'll have Joe go ahead and kick off our song and pledge. Take it away, Joe. Thank you for, for that, and uh, we'll jump right in. I believe we have Eric Spivey on today. If you could go ahead and, and unmute, and uh, Eric's got our invocation. Take it away, Eric. Hey. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Will you pray with me? Today, oh God, we come to you as the shepherd of our souls, and we give you thanks for how you watch over us as we are scattered throughout this Gainesville community and around the country, gathering together online to be able to be together as a community and to learn and to grow together. Lord, we pray that um, you will guide each of us in our club and in our businesses through all the perplexities of this pandemic. May you uphold us in all the adversaries that we have to face. Sustain us in the trials, Comfort us in our grief and strengthen us, O oh Lord, for brave and noble living in our community for the common good. And Lord, now grant that though we are far away from one another, separated by the technology and space, that we'll be gladdened to be together. That the thoughts of this time as we work together to learn and to grow of the science and the technology of the pandemic that it will bring us together and we will feel your presence, each and every one of us, no matter where we are. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eric. All right. We have uh, 
Uh, we'll start with our visiting Rotarians today. If, if I missed anyone, again, um, if you are just jumping on our visiting Rotarian, uh, you can go right down uh, to the chat button in the middle and just uh, uh, introduce yourself there. We'll give you an opportunity to say hi to everybody. But I believe right now we just have one visiting Rotarian today, and that's Katie Floyd. Is that correct? Sorry. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Okay. And what club are you in? All right. Sunrise. Thank you. Sunrise Club. All right. Uh, our, our president, Chad, likes to call that the Sunshine Club at times. So welcome from the Sunrise Club. Uh, it was great to have your uh, all your members be such a, a big part of our Wild Game Feast this year and um, our opportunity to give back. We were talking about that last week, uh, about how we just made the cutoff for that and how it ended up being such a great event. So uh, welcome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and just run down our visiting Rotarians. I'll do my best with the names. So if I'm a little off, I'm sure our president will correct me immediately. Um, so welcome to all of our, our, uh, our, our folks visiting today. Um, we've got Michael uh, Levi, we've got Troy Canada, uh, Rick Carlson, Paul Donnelly, who was our program speaker last week. So welcome back, Paul, glad to have you back again. Um, we have got Eric Strange, um, Barbara Spice, Kathy Barnes, Rania Golinkner, hopefully I got that right, Richard Miles, Carolyn Hansen, uh, we've got Eric Eubank, welcome, uh, Brian Jose, Cole Barnett, and Lisa Chaco. Wesley, if I've missed anybody, if you could chime in, uh, but we'd like to welcome all of our, all of our visitors today. Did I miss? You got them. I got them. Okay, there you go. Impressive. All right, uh, just a, a, we'll jump in. Just a few announcements. We've got a very exciting program today, so we'll move through these uh, couple announcements uh, fairly quickly here. Um, just an update from our, our Zoom happy hour last week, Wednesday. Um, I want to thank TJ for setting that up. It was a, a good time. So when that opportunity presents itself again, it's a, it's a lot of fun. You should jump on there. Um, if you missed the meeting, and uh, you are watching it on YouTube, please send your, uh, just a quick email to info at rotarygainesville.org. Again, that's info at rotarygainesville.org. Um, so you can count for uh, your attendance. Um, so if you could please do that. Uh, we have an announcement next up for uh, Jenny uh, Van Hart. So past president Jenny Van Hart, take it away. Didn't realize I was gonna have to talk to Jason, but sure. Just want to remind everyone that this is the opportunity to uh, promote your business and promote your, um, if you've got a side gig, if you've got, you know, anything that you make, sell, do, whatever, for promoting uh, Rotarians and friends of Rotarians on Facebook. So just send me an email with some information and maybe a couple of and we'll get you up with this week. We're into next week. I'm trying to do one a day. Thanks, everyone. That's fantastic. And thank you. What a great way Rotary means business to kind of advertise your business um, through our Facebook page. So thank you for that, Jenny. Uh, next up, we have a craft talk today. Um, so it looks like we have uh, Victoria Watson doing a craft talk. If you could unmute. And whenever you're ready, you have uh, three minutes. Chad will start the timer. Uh, and we have a large, uh, loud buzzer at the end. All right. Well, hello everyone. My name is Victoria Watson and I was raised here in Gainesville with my two younger sisters. Uh, Bob Watson, a fellow Rotarian, is my father and I actually have a lot of memories of this Rotary Club from growing up. We would come to the Christmas lunch almost every year as a family. I graduated from Buholtz High School, go Bobcats, and then please don't hold this against me but I moved to Tallahassee. I got my undergraduate degree from Florida State and then had the amazing opportunity to go live and work in London for what was supposed to be six months. Uh, it turned into two years and I worked for the Florida State University London Study Abroad program there. After that, I went to South Bend, Indiana, where I got my law degree at Notre Dame. 
And if you've ever experienced lake effect snow, uh, you know why I moved back to Florida. I took the Florida bar and then moved to Broward County where I worked for the state attorney's office down there for about 11 years. I prosecuted a variety of offenses, including sex crimes and domestic violence. Um, I've always enjoyed being involved in the community where I live. I like to, the opportunity to meet people outside my normal social and professional circles. When I was in Broward County, I was involved with the Junior League of Fort Lauderdale. I was a graduate of Leadership Broward, and then also a board member of the Notre Dame Club of Fort Lauderdale. I know we don't have a Notre Dame Club here in Gainesville now, so if there's any uh, other alumni or fans out there who'd be interested in getting together to start one with me, please let me know. Um, I wanted to be closer to family, and all my family lived up here in North Florida. So I have to thank fellow Rotarian Bill Servone, because about three years ago, he uh, offered me a position with the state attorney's office up here in Gainesville, and I had the opportunity to come back home. It's really a privilege being able to do this job in my hometown. I work with Mr. Chervone and fellow Rotarians, Jeannie Singer and Brian Kramer at the state attorney's office here in town. And I'm assigned to prosecute a variety of felony offenses. Um, I have already had the opportunity to meet a lot of you in person when we were doing the meetings and through volunteering at the Wild Game Feast and through some of the other social activities. I'm really looking forward to getting to meet more of you. Hopefully it's in person and, and hopefully it's soon. Thank you. All right, well, Victoria, thank you for that. And uh, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, so very familiar, fun place to, fast moving, but fun place to be, a lot of fun. In fact, that picture that Chad put up of me before was uh, in South Florida, as you can tell. Uh, so there you go. All right, uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn it over. We've got, let's see, I think we had one more visitor join, so uh, near uh, Live, so thank you for joining, uh, visiting today. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to President Chad King. All right, thank you, Jason. I have one quick announcement and then we'll get to today's um, program. The Rotary International Convention this year was to be in Hawaii from June 20th through the 26th. Rather than canceling it, we will have the Rotary International Convention. Uh, there will be three speakers each day, 8 a.m., noon, and 6 p.m. All of it's free and all of it's online. I don't have the specifics yet in terms of links or any of that sort of thing, but when I do, I'll be happy to share them with everyone. That's my only announcement for today. So Richard, would you introduce today's speaker, please? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, thanks, Chad. So I'm gonna keep this introduction short today because we wanna maximize the time that we have with our speaker, Dr. Ilaria Kapua. Uh, I, I think you've all already read her amazing biography. Uh, she's a world-renowned virologist who's, uh, stud who's uh, been honored with nearly 20 major international and national awards and citations. Uh, she rose to international prominence in 1999 through her efforts to quell the Asian influenza outbreak, which was then the largest outbreak of avian flu ever recorded. In 2006, she drew international attention when she challenged the then existing system, which granted only certain scientists access to genetic material sequenced from influenza viruses. Um, she joined UF after spending more than three years as a member of Italian par uh, of Parliament. She has joint appointments with the College of Public Health and Health Professionals at UF, with IFAS, and with the College of Veterinary Medicine. And she leads the UF One Health Center of Excellence in Research and Training. Her calendar, as you can imagine, has been jam-packed since the pandemic. Every hour has been filled. Uh, an example is that this past week, she held an online meeting in which she spoke to the mayors of 40 of the largest cities in the world, including, I believe, Hong Kong, Singapore, and LA. Uh, we're honored and lucky to have Dr. Kapua as our speaker today. So please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Ilaria Kapua. And Dr. Kapua, with that, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. It has been a pleasure to work with you and to work with uh, Joe Floyd. Um, and thanks for your help in being patient. Um, hello. Um, Mr. President, um, 
It is a pleasure to be back at Rotary. Uh, I'm actually uh, a Paul Harris Fellow. Um, this happened many years ago, mm. um, an Italian Rotary Club uh, nominated me for, yeah. So it just suddenly all came back. So thank you for having me. Um, and yeah, so now I'm a Gator, so it's nice to be with all these Gators. And, and uh, I would like to introduce to you Rania Golakner, who is the center coordinator, uh, who is also uh, on this call, and uh, Professor Doug Archer, who is actually the person who recruited me. And so I thought it was nice um, to, to have him here. So uh, I would like to share my screen if this is okay. Um, so thank you and thank you for inviting me and thank you for sharing with you some ideas on, on the pandemic, which, um, which are, it is important that, that people like you um, are able to start thinking about because the pandemic, um, is is a transformational event it will it will it will change and it will touch our lives it will create um great problems but uh, every cloud has a silver lining and i think that as educated people gators people who want to work for the better good we should actually see the silver lining which is between uh, behind what is unfortunately a catastrophe for, for many parts of the world, including my home country. I am Italian, and so my country has been uh, hit very, very hard by this pandemic. So where are we? Um, we are basically with a new virus. Uh, this virus has come out of the animal reservoir. I will um, spend a few slides on this. And uh, originally it was called Wuhan virus, but they then uh, changed its name, the name of the disease in COVID-19. One of the reasons why it took so long to give it a correct name or an appropriate name is that having a virus that has the name of a city has stigma. So just think of having the Gainesville virus. And so just to make you understand how complex some of these issues are when you have to react and have to re react in emergency. This is a disease that causes res mainly respiratory illnesses. It causes a series of other clinical conditions. And I'm sure you've heard um, uh, Dr. Uh, oh, he was here last week. My, his name, Frederick Southwick last week or something. And I'm sure that he told you all about it. So I'm not gonna go into this. I'm gonna tell you though, that over 300 million cases have been diagnosed and there have been 250,000 deaths at least worldwide. Um, I would like to move my slides, but it doesn't seem to, ah, right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm here. So how did this happen? Um, this happened uh, as, as, as it has happened other times. So bats, uh, particularly this bat, it's called a horseshoe bat. It's quite ugly, isn't it? Look at what a scary face it has. It, it harbors lots of viruses, but you know, these viruses just sit in the bat and that's where they should be. They should be in the middle of the forest. They shouldn't be in Gainesville, right? This bat is an, a bat that's widespread in, a, in Asia. And this bat was brought into a market or the virus was brought into a market and it mixed up with a virus from this animal here, which is a pangolin. Pangolin is the most poached species in the planet and it is poached for its scales because they are used in, tri in Chinese traditional medicine and they eat it as well. And so they, they traffic with pangolins and, and they put them in cages and with other animals. And basically out of this, what we got was a virus that infected people uh, and uh, not only one person, as it happened in the past with other infections, this is known to happen, this happens. Mother nature can create some ugly things, and it, but this one spread uh, unfortunately and is still spreading. So 
Um, we know that the virus emerged in China, but we don't know when. The official diagnosis and the dates we have uh, officially are, um, they, they, they say early December, but it was probably before that. It was probably maybe November or even October. And uh, the epicenter was in Hubei province, but we still don't know the patient zero. And just to give you, uh, and another thing we don't know, by the way, is was it the market, the wet market uh, in Hubei, or was it somewhere else? We still have not nailed the, where this virus uh, came from. Um, what is certain is that um, here are the, this you see December 8th, here are some little cases that then you can see my mouse, hopefully at the beginning. Do you see my mouse? No, you can't, I'm sorry. So my mouse is, sorry, um, you see December 8 on the, on the left uh, is uh, at the beginning, you see here's a little bit of cases, maximum 15, and then this is the epidemic curve. Uh, and uh, this is uh, when uh, the WHO declared a public, the public health emergency. So certainly um, this uh, virus has uh, escaped and has infected many, many people. But I wanted to make a point with you. What if this same exact event had happened 100 years ago? 100 years ago, there were not megacities. There were not gigantic live bird markets inside the megacities. And certainly there were not millions of planes coming out of um, a remote area in China. And so, you know how many flights? Uh, no, there were 175,000 passengers that left Wuhan on January 1st, 2020. And, um, between the start of the circulation of the virus and when the lockdown was implemented in, um, in, in Wuhan and in the whole Hubei province, millions of people flew out, millions of people. You only need to look at the air traffic number. And so, and so millions of people flew out and as we know, it is people who spread infection. So the virus doesn't have wings. The virus is perpetuated in people who can be symptomatic and non-symptomatic. And the virus is excreted with secretions and excretions of an infected individual. And it is mainly spread through the microbiome that is present on our hands. Our hands, this is, this is a, a plate that sh with, with a bacteria. So it's, it's the hand of a child just put on a, on a plate. This is the stuff we carry. And this one doesn't show viruses, it just shows bacteria. And so we, we, we touch our face, we sneeze, and, and that's why we need to wash our hands all the time, all the time. That is extremely important. And it is a very important public health measure that also, um, uh, you know, Rotary uh, could support. Um, so here you can see uh, how the infection spread. At the beginning, there were, there were different uh, points of view. This is not a pandemic, it's not gonna spread. He, up there in, on the top, uh, in the middle of the, of the screen, you see that is the clock. You see February 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It was clear that with international transport, the, the virus was going to spread worldwide and this is, and this is what happened. And now, of course, uh, we have, as I said, 3 million cases, but this is uh, a, a gigantic underestimation, I would, I would call it. Um, okay, so what are we seeing uh, with this virus? How is it behaving? 
it is behaving in uh, in different ways in different age groups and uh, um, uh, having a certain age is unfortunately a risk factor for many things. Uh, it is a risk factor for slipping on a banana peel. If you are 20 and you slip on a banana peel, you go home with a bruise, maybe a broken leg. If you are 80 and you slip on a banana peel, you most likely, unfortunately, break your hip, and that is much worse. So um, age is a risk factor for many things, and it is a risk factor for COVID. That is why uh, people who are over a certain age, who have underlying conditions, should stay protected as much as they can. As much as they can, because it is ultimately their responsibility not to um, develop the disease. But it can, it can even affect young people, especially if they're genetically predisposed, if they have underlying conditions. We know that some children actually have been affected because they have underlying conditions. And if you have, um, issues with your uh, uh, lung health. One thing is for certain that one of the most uh, important risk factors are mass gatherings. And look, I, I really, really don't wish I was wrong. And I really would like to be saying something else that mass gatherings are going to have to be canceled because because this is how the infection spreads. So it, in, it spreads in asymptomatic carriers that infect lots of people and these people take, and the, and the people then take infection home to their loved ones. And uh, so I, I, I'm sorry, but at this stage for how much we know and with what we have at this point in time, I'm afraid that mass gatherings, let's say they are gonna have to be reinvented. And this has enormous ramifications on religion on, on religious gatherings, on sports, on sp how are we going to do the sports gatherings, and of course of entertainment, which is, um, which is uh, one of the most hit in the street to date. And you know, if you made a mistake, if you make a mistake, the virus doesn't really care that you were you made a mistake to do a good thing. The virus, unfortunately, just doesn't have a brain, doesn't think, doesn't. It's like a photocopying machine. It will just replicate itself. And if you die, you die. And, and he just goes on. And so I think that uh, as, as a community of, of educated people and people in business and in academia, this is something that we should keep in mind. And um, so here are some of the ways, the main ways that, that COVID spreads. But let me just point your attention on what words are the most underlined and what do you need to do restriction 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 stay at home stay at home i'm really sorry but people at risk are going to have to stay at home because if they don't it could be dangerous for the whole for their own health and i just want to make one point which is it, and and if it's not crisp enough tell me at the end of this talk because i really need, need to make people understand so the catastrophe that this virus brings with it is when intensive care units of hospitals collapse because there are too many people who need care, right? So what we need to look at as the indicator of how the situation is going is the number of admissions in ICU. It's not the number of infections. But remember that the number of admissions in ICU is what happened from, a dyna from an epidemic point of view two weeks before. Because the, we the virus takes two weeks to, to make you sick, right? So the intensive care unit cases we see now relate to contagion that occurred two weeks ago. So if you say now, nothing is happening. I have seen pictures of, of people in Naples, Florida, um, uh, who are, all of them have white hair and all of them are outside and all of them are congregating. This I think is very, is very dangerous at this stage. Okay, another, another file that I would not like to open, but 
this is the way it is and we need to know. So do animals get infected with COVID? Actually they do. They have the same receptors as people. Uh, uh, and uh, they have, sorry, they have, a, they have a receptor. It's not the same as people. They have a receptor which is compatible with the virus. And so there are a series of animals that can get infected. Some are domestic and some are not. So we have dogs, cats, and minks that have been shown to be infected uh, in various parts of the world. But my concern is that this disease could, which is currently a pandemic, could become a panzootic. What does panzootic mean? Panzootic means that it infects all animals. So it will infect people and pe human beings are animals just just in case you didn't realize that from a virus's perspective we are not very different from an animal because the virus looks at our receptors it doesn't look at anything else and we have the same receptors in this case that other animals have so we could be looking at a disease that could evolve into multiple lineages in animals. And we're gonna to have to manage it because I don't wanna ask because I know it'll be 80% of the people on this call have a pet. And then there's just another little issue that we have to remember that we are working and we are living in a fake news environment. And uh, we have to learn to select our sources of information and we have to learn to help our peers and our friends and our, um, and our, our teenagers to be able to select the right um, sources of information because uh, we want people to be informed properly. Um, okay, so I think that uh, we can now start looking at COVID from another perspective, okay? So this was the biological aspects. This was the story, how did it happen? What is it doing? But COVID actually is, is, is a stress test and it's a stress test for fragile systems because it is not only a stress test for health. It is a stress test for families. Just think of families that are locked up in flats and don't have enough computers to connect. It's a stress test for, um, uh, transportation systems. It's a, a, a stress test that is going to change a lot of our life because it is clear that the virus would have never arrived in the United States, in Florida, or in Europe if we did not have the network of airplanes that we have. But actually, it's not only airplanes because it is even ships. You know that there's been issues with cruise ships. And this is not only cruise ships, but these are all the vessels that are in the sea now. And so we have focused maybe on 40 cruise ships that have had problems and what do we do? Do we let people on, off? But of course, all of these cruise ships are also, are also spreading infection because infection spreads with people. But one thing that I would like to point out to you is that this virus is a, is a stress test for cities, big cities. Cities are suffering. Uh, Miami is suffering, New York is suffering, uh, big European cities are, are suffering, Madrid is suffering, Milan is suffering, um, uh, Paris of course, London, London is suffering very much. London in the UK they have um, I think the highest death toll in Europe. And why? Well because in cities there's lots of people, because in cities um, there are gatherings and also there is pollution. And uh, on this, I would like to mention what Dr. Abramos, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Tedros, who is the Director General of WHO said on, on, um, on the pandemic, which is, it is the real concerns is that it health, it hits countries with a fragile health system. But actually, I think that this is not the only, the only the only concern, because the concern is this, it's the economic ramifications. You all know that in the United States, there have been now over 3 million people who are claiming for unemployment benefits. So is it, it's a disease, it's a disease which affects the economy, but 
but it's a disease which affects movement, global movement. Does it make sense that we have cities in the sky that are flying with people from all over the world when look at what a good meeting we're having just now? And now this will bring me to the end of my talk. And I like to see challenges as opportunities. This is something I have always done in my life. And, and I think that I, we need to look at what are the positive ramifications of this catastrophe. And the first one is that nature is back. The planet is breathing. Um, we all live in Gainesville. We know what, what it means to have, say, have the planet is back. Um, and look at what is happening in China. The amount of, of pollution has dropped in uh, just over uh, a month dramatically. And China is one of the most polluted uh, countries of the world. But not only, not only you can see the Himalayas from, um, from uh, uh, Mumbai, and, it is, and these are 200 kilometers away, and it hadn't happened for, for, 20, for 30 years. And so uh, the planet is breathing. You know, the planet is telling us, yeah, you know, hey, I'm here, I'm here. And so COVID automatically becomes an accelerator for interdisciplinarity because everybody wants to work together because they understand that this is not only a problem that doctors will solve. We need to work with urban planning. We need to work with economists. We need to work with uh, people who know about pollution, who know about um, uh, mass movements, transportation. And so at the University of Florida, we have developed this new initiative, which is a convergence initiative. It is, it is called the Yellow Submarine, um, actually the ELO Submarine. And it is a wonderful opportunity because um, we have created uh, an informatic infrastructure in, um, together with CERN. CERN is the largest physics infrastructure in the world. And uh, CERN um, has offered uh, a compartment within its infrastructure um, for COVID-19 research. And basically, we are leading this effort. Uh, this effort will be called Circular Health. And it, uh, it is uh, with a, a grassroots movement. So people from many different disciplines, architects, engineers, scientists, virologists, doctors, veterinarians, uh, lots of data scientists, lots of people in UF, lots of people outside US, UF are, are working together on this with the help of CERN. And uh, one of the things we are doing is we are working on seeing how pollution has impacted clinical outcome and if pollution is linked to a more, uh, higher number of cases, we are investigating gender because it seems from many countries that uh, women are less susceptible to developing the um, uh, severe clinical form. Women do not go in intensive care they when they get sick but they don't get very sick and so actually women are less at risk much at a much lesser risk than men in 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 certain countries certainly and this should be part of a public health response it should be public part of an educated public health response so this is another issue that we are investigating and one of the things that because I am Italian and we have a wonderful heritage in Italy, we are working with a team in UF, which includes the B Lab and other, other groups um, to study how we can, uh, we can measure the resilience of nature uh, in some of the Italian heritage, a cultural heritage. Uh, some of the Italian cities have been devastated and have had thousands of people dying. And I think that science and um, ecology and interest in the environment and in nature can pass through the heritage, our culture, which has also suffered so much during this pandemic. And um, 
just a quick reminder, remember that it's people that spread COVID-19. And we need to engage with people. We need to make people understand the importance of science. And this gives me the opportunity to show you this video of it's only one, um, one minute and 40 seconds long. Um, and this is the advertisement. Uh, and um, this is the video. Andrea, but can you hear it? Can you hear it? No, you can't. Okay. I think maybe it, we'd, uh, we, you know, is probably, we've got some good questions rolling through, so. Might be a good time for that. All right, Ilaria, thank you so much for speaking to our group today. You did an amazing job and we're very grateful for your time and your presentation. We are going to make a donation in your name to inoculate 100 children from the polio virus. So thank you so much for, <laughs> for your presentation today. We do have a number of questions. Um, the first question, are you suggesting there's a genetic confirmation of transmission from the bats in Wuhan to humans, contrary to the suspicion some have that the virus originated in a Chinese laboratory? Well, what I can say is that there is no evidence that the virus originated in a Chinese laboratory. The evidence we have does not point in that direction. If this is the case, they'll, they'll find out. So I really would not worry about it because uh, genetic markers, and um, there are tools that allow you to understand whether that is a laboratory generated virus or not. So the, all the evidence, there is not one piece of evidence that goes in that direction. Okay. That's thank all I can say, I'm a scientist, so. Sure. Yeah, thank you. How essential is the use of masks in controlling the virus? So masks, uh, there's different, masks is a big word, okay? I would say that, um, first of all, you don't have to go out if you're sick, and if you're sick, it doesn't matter if you wear a mask. You only go out if you're healthy. If you, uh, the mask actually protects others, does not protect yourself. So it is a way of uh, respecting others. It, it, is, it protects yourself it is, uh, if it is of a certain type and not all masks are the same. And we cannot communicate mixed messages to people. And so I would stick to saying that masks are a physical barrier they, um, they, and they are a way of respecting others in case you are a non-symptomatic carrier. All right, thank you. The next question, when we walk our neighborhood with our dogs, everyone wants to pet the dogs and we usually pet their dogs. How much of a risk is that considering all the interactions are outdoors and we're all otherwise being super careful? Well, um, yes, you, you, you can pet dogs. Um, and it's fine. And if, if you don't feel comfortable, don't pet dogs. So what, with, if, she, if the, the question is about um, um, if dogs can be infected or if people can spread the infection to dogs, that is a big question mark. And I don't want to go down that road because there's a little bit of evidence. It's just that I, I say it because I'm talking to an educated community and public health officials and veterinarians and the local, you know, um, health providers are going to have to think about it because what happens if infection starts circulating in dogs? So what are we going to do? How are we going to manage it? You know, so we need to think about it. That's so uh, I, I, I mean, if I'm walking on the same side of the street and you want to pat the dog, that's fine. If you, I wouldn't go on the other side of the street to pat the dog because maybe the guy on the other side of the street doesn't want this dog to be patted. Got it. Uh, the next question is, how do you suggest countering the anti-science, anti-vaccine movement? 
So this, thank you for this question, which is very important. And I would really like to ask Rania if she can please find a way to share that video because it is a video, I'm sure you know who Andrea Bocelli is. Andrea Bocelli granted us, the One Health Center, the rights to use a song, which is about the passion and the pride of being a scientist. And the, the anti-science movement is a tragedy of, this times, of, of, of these times. It is uh, fueled by fake news and we must find new ways to, um, to fight it. And actually one of the things that I've been working on is I've been working with uh, radios. Um, I've been working with the um, second channel of the Italian broadcasting national radio to develop songs for children to like fun songs to to wash their hands and I think that because it so it's not going to be Trump or Conte or Johnson or uh, the governor of Florida or it's going to be people who are going to fix this so if Trump or the Italian president Conte says, you shouldn't go and see somebody who is not your relative. And this, and you, because he's not, he, he is your relative, you go and see your relative, but your relative is 102 and is in a nursing home, you should not go and see them. So we need to move the center of responsibility of solving this problem from the government or the administration or the president or to the people. It's people who are spreading it. And so we have to empower people. And we can only empower people if we speak the same language. And one of the languages that we can speak to people with is music and art. And we have a program which has been going on for quite a long time on how to engage people with music. And this Bocelli video that I'm trying to show you has been seen by 133,000 people. And we are aiming at 1 million people um, having it seen in one year. And it was a joint effort which was launched at the same time from the Italian embassy in uh, Washington and the American embassy in Rome because science is a universal value. All right, thank you. The next question, is it time to reevaluate the role of population control in the total health of the planet? Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a big question. Uh, and, and thank you, you know. So, um, what we have seen is that big cities, big cities don't work. They, they, they can't work with this type of problem. So let me just uh, tell you what has happened in, in Italy. So Lombardy, which is the north, the north of Italy. So you, you more or less know what I'm talking about. It's where Milan is the fashion, all the money, right? The money. So Lombardy has invested in private health because private, so in Italy we have private healthcare and public healthcare. Public healthcare works, okay? It works. But if you want a super, super, super treatment, you go to a private hospital and you get the best of the world. So Lombardy has actually centralized and healthcare and has provided uh, a type of care which is of uh, incredibly high level levels, but it is not really on the territory. And so the people who were getting sick, who were like, you know, like 20 miles away, 30 miles away and so on, they didn't find a doctor who would tell them what to do. And so they all went to the hospital. And they all went to the hospitals, and, and so infection, the hospitals became, became amplifiers of infection. And so, and 
you know, this is what happened in Madrid, what happened in New York. This is what happens in hospitals. You know, it's no secret. And so with reference to your question, will we have to develop like a special, spe like, you know, hospitals dedicated to this type of emergencies? Well, that's a thought. That's a thought. Certainly, we're going to have to do something about our relationship with wildlife and with nature because we've been messing it up a bit too much. And, 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 and you know, and by the way, uh, so uh, since I've been working in, in virology, right, so I'm 53, uh, and 54, ah, I'm 54, 21st of April, so I forgot, you know. So I'm 54, I've been in the vir in working in virology. I worked for about 30 years um, and I have been through um, um, so the SAR so SARS, MERS, uh, bird flu, uh, H, uh, um, Zika, Ebola, uh, okay, and this is the sixth. So these things happen. It's like, so in, in 30 years, this is the sixth time that we've had a lot of trouble. And when this emerged, I don't know if anybody of you follows Twitter, but I'm on Twitter. And one of the first hashtags I sent out is pandemics cost, because I really wanted the, the business community to, to understand that, that this was going to be an economic catastrophe. And, and, um, and actually, um, it is, and it's, it's really bad, and it's a real pity that nobody believed it at the start. You know, nobody understood that something like this would happen to us and that our systems are so fragile. So I don't know if we have any more time. I just wanted to say uh, I'm a Floridian by adoption, and, uh, I, and you, are, you are Floridians and you are, um, you know, citizens and people who are active in the city, I'm a foreigner, please tell your friends and your, your friends and relatives in their in retirement homes, please tell them that, that you know, in, uh, like in the UK, half of the people died or in retirement homes. It's, it could really be bad. So just let's be careful and let's um, uh, learn as we go because unfortunately we're learning as we're going. We didn't know about this virus before. Uh, you know, just four months ago, and let's work all together for public health. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for speaking to our group today. Uh, we are out of time, but we have some more questions. Are you able to stick around for a little bit and answer some more questions? Um, yes, and I have a call coming in uh, at one, and maybe if she's okay, well, we'll, okay, we'll let let's you... try. If you want right, to try, so we will, we try. <laughs> all right, we'll formally adjourn the meeting. So for the folks that need to go, we are adjourned. And if you're able to stay, we'll keep going uh, as long as we're able. The next question is, is our immune system at risk while staying at home? And what can we do to maintain a healthy immune system? So I don't know because I'm not an immunologist. So I, I can tell you as a mother, I'm not an immunologist, but of course, vitamin D, the sun, sun is good, sun is bad. Sun is good, sun is bad. Too much is not good. Uh, you have to eat properly. You have to keep your immune system going and, and um, keep smiling and, and see this as something that will change our lives, but we can change it for the good. And I think that good spirits are good for your immune, disease, for your immune uh, system. I don't know. Um, cities begin that's what I would tell my mom. <laughs> As cities begin with staged reopenings, can we monitor circulating virus in the community well enough to know when we can move to the next stage? So one of the problems is that our diagnostics are not very good. So at the moment, we can't really... So staging makes sense, right? It makes sense, of course, because rather than, you know... So I've seen that somewhere here in Florida, some places have reopened and they, and they have like tables outside, right? So there, there's like things that they don't do all together, but slowly, slowly, and, and maintain clean hands, maintain distancing. So let's never forget that, 
we can lead a normal life even if we don't hug and kiss like Italians all the time. <laughs> the Italians are in despair. You can imagine, they're all there pulling their hair out. How does COVID-19 compare to the Hong Kong flu of 1968? Actually, so uh, this virus behaves like an influenza-like illness, right? It, it, it is very similar to influenza. Uh, it is a good comparison because that was an influenza pandemic, so it was a completely new virus. But I would say that it compares more actually, as, like, as it is perceived by the general population to the Asian flu of 1957-58. I'm sure that some of you remember it. If, there, if any one of you was in a, high, in a boarding school, in a, like in a military setting or something, like or with lots of people, that was that put so many people to bed. Uh, so it does compare with the, but there's another thing that I need to add that the demographics is, is, um, uh, is very different now, of course, because in those years we did, we, we had a younger population, right? Because average age has, has grown so much. I don't see, oh, sorry, last question it looks like. Can you recommend a good source of COVID-19 information to guide churches to instruct our congregations in how to care for themselves and our community? CDC website. CDC okay. website has everything you need. So, but, but you see churches, right? They should, speak to the people and decline this hand washing to their everyday, you know, to, to when they speak to their, to their community. It is important, uh, the, the, actually the whole, you know, all of the religious communities are important. People need to wash their hands all the time. They still need to stop shaking hands and, and this can be done in the, at least, for a couple of months, okay? So we get to the summer, it's better, and we look back and there's like two or three months behind us with no intensive care overload, then we can start shaking hands, okay? Not before that. What do you think the, oops, on you, nope, all right. What do you think the differential effects of the virus on men and women what can we attribute that to? Why is that different? We have a working group that's trying to figure it out. It could be linked to many, many things. Men have different underlying conditions, especially in some parts of the world. Like in Italy, men of, who are like 70 and 80 used to smoke much more than women. That could be one of the reasons. Um, the virus is certainly uh, doing well with uh, a receptor that is well is expressed uh, uh, with androgens. So there is a hormonal component. Um, it could be that it's because men uh, are more um, susceptible to cardiovascular disease, to hypertension in certain, I mean, we don't know. It could even be because women maybe wash their hands more. I mean, I don't know. It could be that, right? It could be that women are more with children and they get more of the asymptomatic form, and so they're more protected. We don't know, and we're trying to find out because we need to advise policymakers. And that is, and thank you for this question, because this is exactly what the center, my center is doing. It is trying to address these questions so that we can help the mayor of, Ga of Gainesville, the mayor of Atlanta, the mayor of, of uh, Los Angeles to manage this in a, in a in a more educated way, because you know we don't have a lot of the answers. We have, um, but we need to be part of the solution. All right, I think that's all of our questions. It looks like, so thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Rania. Can you please make sure that they have the link to yes. beautiful science? And if you can Hilaria. please spread it in your community, we're trying to do one million views 
in one year and we have until November. So we still, we don't have to do it like tomorrow, okay? So we have a bit of time. Please help me show it to your grandchildren, show it to your school teacher, friends. Science is beautiful. Science is not ugly. Science is not about creating viruses in lab. Science is about uh, curing people. It's about learning about people. It's about finding solutions. And so we need to inspire the next generation to be, um, to be uh, not afraid of science. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here. It was a pleasure to see you smiling and nodding. And um, let's be in touch and uh, visit our One Health website because you might find some interesting things. Thank you very much, and bye-bye to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ilar Ilaria. Uh, we're, we're going to uh, be uh, sending around that link to the uh, music uh, on, on our uh, email, and we're also going to be posting it in the YouTube. Uh, Thank you. So everybody can view in the afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone, and stay safe, okay? Thank you.